I'm Dr. Curtis Cornish, and I would like to talk to you today about how blood pressure is controlled. As indicated by the title, it's under both neuronal and hormonal mechanisms. Now, this is a diagram that I put together to give you some idea of what's going on. Hopefully, by the time we are finished with this, you'll understand the various components of that. The control of blood pressure, as I stated, is under both neural and hormonal control. As we look at the neural control, we look at two parts of it. One is the high pressure system and the other is the low pressure system. The high pressure system in, involves those receptors that we don't normally can think of and they are actually controlling blood pressure and the low pressure system controls volume. And on the hormonal side we have norepinephrine which comes primarily from the sympathetic nerves. We have epinephrine which is uh, released from the adrenal medulla we have antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. And I think that you need to understand a little history here. When this was first discovered, it was identified as a vasoconstrictor agent. It was called a vasopressin. When the assays became more sensitive, they found that it was being released in lower levels and was involved very much in the control of volume. And so they can renamed it antidiuretic hormone. The last of those hormone systems is the renal angiotensin aldosterone system, and we'll be walking through that and help you to understand that. Now, I'm going to make the point as we go on that the uh, nervous system is very much involved in the immediate control of blood pressure, while the hormonal system is probably that system most involved with the long-term control of, of blood pressure. Uh, there are some basics I need to think we need to review. First of all, in physiologic systems, we have a feedback. And these can be either positive or, or negative feedback. As a rule, positive feedbacks are, are fatal. As an example of that, if you have a drop in blood pressure, coronary blood flow goes down, and cardiac output and contractility go down, and that decreases blood pressure. And so if you uh, continue that on, you continue a, a um, positive feedback, which has a very negative spiral. On the other hand, if we have a, a negative feedback, blood pressure goes down. There are compensatory neuronal and later on hormonal things that bring the pressure back. And cardiac output and coronary flow maintain the same. Now the ability of a system to bring the system back to normal is called gain. If a system has infinite gain, then it'll bring the pressure all the way back. The neuronal system does not have infinite gain, which means that there's always a slight error signal. When we look at the hormonal system, the gain is apparently infinite, and so we uh, can bring the pressure back. I think in understanding this, you need to go back to the history a little bit. And there were a number of individuals who were involved in looking at these systems. Uh, Dr. Hamans is one who's uh, received the Nobel Prize for his work with this. And this uh, presentation that you see here is taken from the book called Reflexogenic Areas of the Cardiovascular System by Hamans and Neal, a very classic work but been out of print for a long, a long time. And so in this, he's showing the carotid artery here, internal carotid here, and the carotid sinus nerve or herring's nerve here with the carotid body right here. So here's the sinus, that magic area controlling blood pressure are very much involved in that. And this shows you some of the experiments that he did where they would do what are called cross circulation. They would have an intervention in this animal and see how it affected this animal. So in this situation, they increase the blood pressure. And in this other animal, the blood pressure went down. And it had to be neural because that was the only connection the two animals had. So classically, we look at the system like this, where we have the carotid sinus as classically identified here. And the nerve goes up, herring's nerve, to the glossopharyngeal nerve. 
On the other side of that, we have the aortic arch. Now this part is very uh, densely innervated with receptors that are both mechanical and chemo, so we have chemo receptors here too. Now these receptors feed into the brain up to the vagus nerve. Importantly, all of them terminate in a structure in the medullary centers of the brain called the nucleus tractus solitarius or NTS and that's the primary uh, sensory um, nucleus in the uh, spinal cord I'm sorry in the brainstem and it's the first synapse for these receptors if you were to record from these uh, from an axon coming from the carotid sinus you'd find that the rate of rise determines the firing rate now the mean pressure in both of these is the same in this situation we have gradually increased just the pressure and that's a non positive pressure and you can see that as you do that the firing rate increases tremendously so these receptors are, due, are responsive to both the absolute pressure and the rate of rise of that pressure. Now let's look at this in a continuum. If we start off and the intervention has a blood pressure going down, the receptors located in the carotid sinus and the aortic arch then are going to feed that information into the brain again starting the NTS. That will go to the hypothalamus and that by itself will cause the release of ADH because in high concentrations it's a vasoconstrictor and does increase blood pressure. Now we're going to have uh, two kinds of interventions that will happen here. The parasympathetic by way of the vagus goes to the heart and if it turns on it's going to decrease heart rate. Well, obviously, that's not what we want under this situation, so this response is going to cut off that input. So that's taking the brake off, allowing the heart rate to increase. The sympathetic, on the other hand, is going to increase. That's going to increase heart rate, increase contractility, and the two of those are going to increase stroke volume. And of course, that will help to increase the blood pressure. The sympathetics are also going to come down here and act on the arterial side to increase resistance, causing vasoconstriction. Total periphery resistance is going to go up. They will also act on the venous side, constricting the veins, causing an increase in volume because it'll be shifted out of those uh, large veins into the central circulation. The sympathetics also go into the kidney are going to produce renin. Now I've got renin down here just to remind you that renin and renin are not the same. Renin is an uh, enzyme that's produced in the stomach of uh, cows and other ungulates and is a digestive uh, enzyme. The renin angiotensin system we're going to walk through in just a minute. So that's the beginning of where we're at with those. Now let's look at the kidney. We've already talked about renin production. Renin is produced by these cells, the ejection glomerular cells. And there are two things that will cause a release. One is that the sympathetic nerves are going to act on these cells to cause the release of renin. And the other is that a decrease in perfusion pressure or blood pressure, going to that will cause the release of renin. So there are two things then that control this. And this is a better picture. Uh, we're talking about the JG cells being right here. Now let's take a minute to talk about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So renin angiotensin aldosterone or RAS is it sometimes referred to. So again, we start off with a drop in blood pressure. That drop in blood pressure is sensed by the carotid and aortic barrier receptors. It feeds that into the CNS, as we've discussed, into the NTS. And that then is going to increase the sympathetic activity. 
The sympathetic nerves then are acting directly on the dextroglomerular cells of the kidney to cause the production of renin. That reduced blood pressure is also going to act on the JG cells to cause the release of renin. Now we have a substance in the circulation called angiotensinogen that's produced by the, kid, by the liver. And angiotensin 1 then acts on this and clips off 10 amino acids. Now these 10 amino acids then are angiotensin 1 or A1. Throughout the circulation we have what is called angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE. And it's a nonspecific carboxypeptidase that clips off ten, uh, two additional amino acids to give us an eight amino acid substance. And that's angiotensin II. Now let me just mention the production of ACE. ACE is produced by all of the endothelial cells in the vasculature. In some literature you'll see a reference that it's produced in the lungs. Well, there's no doubt that it is but that's because of the tremendous amount of endothelial cells in the lungs. But it is produced throughout the, the cardiovascular system. Now angiotensin II is the real workhorse. It's going to act on the adrenal cortex to cause the release of aldosterone. Aldosterone is going to act on the kidney to cause the reabsorption of sodium. Now you can't just reabsorb sodium, you have to reabsorb both sodium and water, and so you have the retention of sodium and water which then causes an increase in blood volume, and that tends to increase the blood pressure. Angiotensin II is also a vasoconstrictor, very potent vasoconstrictor, causes the constrictions of both veins and arteries, increasing volume with venal constriction, and increasing total periphery resistance. Angiotensin II also acts directly on the CNS to cause the release of ADH. Uh, remember that ADH is an antidiuretic, so that causes retention of water. It's also a vasoconstrictor. It also causes the CNS to um, increase thirst. And so that increase in thirst actually does increase volume. So this is the only place we've gotten th thus far where we can really increase volume. All of the others is retaining and moving the volume around. So that increases our blood pressure. Now I want to make a point about the rapidity of these two systems for the release of um, renin. <coughs> we took a number of monkeys and chronically instrumented them and, and had them awake in, the, in their cages. We did this at night so they'd be sleeping. And we, first of all, blocked the sympathetic nerves with a substance called hexamethonium, which got, blocks the sympathetic ganglion, and the blood pressure dropped down from 100 to 50. Surprisingly, this didn't seem to bother the animals very much. Over a period of 20 minutes, we, the pressure stayed down there. Now, I don't know how long it would have stayed there, but I was nervous, and so we gave them more epinephrine to bring the pressure back up. So we were, we did, were not seeing any evidence in this of the release of renin. We wanted to investigate further without the block, and so we did a hemorrhage, which again dropped to the same level. And we noted that blood pressure gradually started coming up. We then gave a converting enzyme inhibitor, and the blood pressure went down. So this suggested that this rise is a result of the release of renin. To confirm our suspicions, we cut the nerves to the kidney, and this time we hemorrhaged to get the pressure down, and the pressure went down, and we did not see any increase in blood pressure. Our conclusion was that this is all due to the neural innervation of the kidney to cause the release of renin. Now, we could conclude erroneously that in the primate that it's totally under the control of the nerves. We know this is not true because if you have a renal artery constriction, 
you can get massive amounts of renin released and uh, sus a significant hypertension. Um, the thing that we're saying is that that's very slow and it's not a rapid response. Now in order to study the, the bowel reflexes, the blood pressure is artificially raised and lowered to see what's happening and see how the various parts are involved. We gave a substance known as phenylephrine, which is an alpha agonist, causes vasoconstriction of both the veins and the arteries. This is left ventricular pressure taken from a transducer in the left ventricle. And so we have time along this axis. <coughs> the left ventricular end diastolic pressure is gradually going up, suggesting a venoconstriction and shifting of blood into the left atrium. Because of the resistance, our blood pressure is going up. Because of the resistance and the decrease in heart rate, our cardiac output is going down. The heart rate is totally a reflex, and it's the result of the changes in blood pressure. So we can look at the effect there. We can also increase total periphery resistance in another way. We had an occluder around the descending aorta, which allows us to increase the resistance to the heart is seeing. And so this again is left ventricular pressure aortic pressure, left atrial pressure, which you'll see is gradually going up because the heart can't eject everything against that resistance, so it backs up in left atrium. Coronary flow is going up, and this is primarily the result of the increased work on the heart. Cardiac output is going down because of the increased resistance that the heart has to pump about against. But here again, the drop in heart rate is our reflex, and that's the reflex that is a result of the uh, baroreceptor, the increase in blood pressure. Another way to look at this is to decrease the return of blood to the heart. And we had an occluder. Now, I didn't mention that all of these were done in conscious dogs that have been instrumented for several weeks to months. So if we occlude the vena cava, the inferior vena cava, we're reducing venous return. Obviously, ventricular pressure is going down. Left ventricular end diastolic pressure is going down. Blood pressure is going down. The left atrial pressure is going down because it's now being backed up into the venous side. Cardiac output's going down because it doesn't have anything to pump, even though the heart rate is going up. So again, the heart rate is reflex, and these others are direct effects. Another way to do this is by giving a vasodilator, nitroglycerin, dilates both the arteries and the veins. And again, you see the drop in blood pressure and the reflex increase in heart rate. Cardiac output in this situation is actually going up because we're decreasing the afterload, which allows us to increase our stroke volume. And we also have the increase in heart rate. But the Left atrial pressure is going down, showing us that we really do have blood backing up onto the venous side. Total peripheral resistance goes down because of the vasodilation on that side. Now I want to talk about a, a reflex system that's part of the control of blood pressure that is not found in many textbooks. And I think it's because it's poorly understood. There are receptors that are located in the posterior wall of the left ventricle. And these receptors are both mechanoreceptors, so they're sensitive to stretch, and they're uh, metabolic receptors, so that they're uh, chemoreceptors. So they respond to the release of metabolites by the heart. So these receptors travel up the vagus into the medullary centers again, and then back down to the heart, very short loop, which means it's very fast. And so the response is a bradycardia, which you can see here, and it's very rapid. You notice that the blood pressure goes down. If you pace the heart artificially, the blood pressure doesn't change very much, so it's primarily a vagal bradycardia. And this shows another tracing that we looked at in the conscious dog. 
veratrodine is the substance that artificially activates these receptors. And so we injected that into the left circumflex coronary artery. And you notice the heart rate stopped. We had pacing electrodes that we were stimulating on the left atrium, trying to get the heart rate go up. But this activity of the vagus was so strong that we had an uh, AV block. And it wasn't until later on that we were able to get the heart rate up again. And important to note is that this response is working against the arterial barrier receptors in the carotid sinus and aortic arch. So they should be countering this, but they are unable to do so. So it's a very powerful response. Again, it's showing the heart rate just stopped. Aortic flow stopped. Now, as I said, most people discount this re re response because they say that, well, in order to study it, you have to give something artificial. If you, again, take out the barrier receptors and then stretch the, or increase the blood pressure in the aorta, you can get this response. It only responds on the high pressure side, so it's responsive to increases in pressure, but not decreases in pressure. And so the normal role of this reflex is to prevent the overloading of the left ventricle. And it does so by causing this vagal bradycardia. And it's responsive on a beat-by-beat -beat basis. In the normal situation, it's acting in concert with the arterial barrier receptors, and so you really couldn't distinguish between a vagal bradycardia caused by, by ventricular receptors or a vagal bradycardia caused by the carotid sinus and the aortic arch. There are some times when you see it. In severe situations of shock, the blood pressure drops, sympathetic activity is increased, and you have a very intense constriction of the heart, but it's not contracting against anything, and so it distorts these receptors, causes them to fire, and the heart almost stops. It's called inappropriate vagal bradycardia. If you see that, the way to counter that is to give atropine, which then will block the vagus allow heart rate to come up. If you have an infarction of the posterior wall of the left ventricle, you have metabolites which are going to activate that, and that's going to cause the bradycardia as well. So this is the visual gyrus reflex of the ventricular receptors, and again, is very powerful. Now let's look for a minute on the, high, uh, on the low side. <coughs> The main f reflex we're going to look at is called the Henry Gower reflex. This is a very slow response in primates. It's fairly rapid in qu quadrupeds. You have receptors located in the left atrium. And when these are activated or inhibited, then you have that signal being sent up to the uh, CNS. And that's going to cause the release of ADH. So if our blood pressure goes down, then you have an increase in ADH. Again, basic constrictor in large doses, but in smaller doses, it acts as an antidiuretic hormone, and it causes a retention of water by the kidney. And that in, uh, retention of water by the kidney then is going to bring our blood pressure back up. Now, in this response, as in all others, you have to understand that the system is not generating new volume. And so even though these may be short-term and for long-term fixes, you have to have an increase in volume. Under, under situations where you have s severe drops in blood pressure, there is a tremendous amount of ADH released. Now ADH is also involved in the control of osmolality and volume, but when you have tremendous drops in blood pressure, the amount of ADH release is magnitudes higher than you get under the others. So it is, it is important in uh, blood pressure control as well. Now if you look at the response of the receptors in the left atrium, you'll notice that in the dog, 
that they are very sensitive. It doesn't take very much of a change in pressure to increase the firing rate. In the monkey, on the other hand, they are not very sensitive. Now that's fortunate for us. In the dog, if left atrial pressure changes, it's because you've had a change in vo blood volume and you need to do something about that. In the primate, if left atrial pr pressure changes, it may be just because you've stood up or laid down. So stretching these receptors is going to cause <coughs> uh, a diuresis. So when you lay down, you have a shift of volume into the left atrium. And if you were a dog, it would take you about three minutes for the diuresis to start. We are fortunate that it's not that responsive, otherwise we couldn't get any sleep. So it's a very sensitive response in the, in the quadruped, but not in the primate. Now let's look at long-term control. If we record continuously in a primate, and these we did in, in quite a few monkeys, you'll find that the blood pressure is ranging between about 75 and 125. And this shows the percent of time is spent at any one of these pressures. So we're spending most of his time right here. So with the baroreceptors intact, and these again are conscious monkeys that are being recorded for days in a cage, this is the average blood pressure. When you take out the baroreceptors, you'll find that the average blood pressure has not changed much. The variability has changed significantly. And so the baroreceptors are preventing uh, fluctuation on a short-term basis, but are simply not involved in the long-term control of blood pressure. And I think that's something that's important to remember. So we, here we have a recording of a dog that was sleeping in the lab, had been instrumented several months before, recording blood pressure. <coughs> and you'll notice that there's a nice fluctuation in blood pressure. And that fluctuation is actually his breathing rate. As he breathes in and out, that increases and decreases venous return. The increase and decrease in venous return increases cardiac output, which gives you this fluctuation. But you also have the reflex associated with that. So these pauses are actually vagal bradycardias, so that this increase in p blood pressure causes this decrease in heart rate, all vagal, and it's very fast. The sympathetic response is much slower, it takes eight to 10 seconds for it to come into play. I hope that this will give you an idea about how blood pressure is controlled and some of those mechanisms involved. And thank you for listening.